So next, we're going to be diving into policy decisions. Uh, what policies do we need to support industrial decarbonization? So for today's discussion, we are joined by, and I'm going to call out your name, and please join me on stage, have a seat, and we'll get this discussion going on. Uh, we are joined by Sam Taylor, who is the Assistant Director of the West Virginia uh, University Energy Institute. We have Destiny Nock, an, uh, an Assistant Professor here at CMU of Engineering and Public Policy, as well as Civil and Environmental Engineering. We have Stefan Feilhauer. He is the Managing Director of the S2G Clean Energy Fund. <clears throat> we have Abby Smith, President and CEO of Team Pennsylvania. We have Ashley Ross, who is the VP of Strategic Engagements uh, and Policy for Carbon America. And we have Tim McNulty, who I believe is doing his job in the hallway, but he's on double duty, making sure that, his, that policies are influenced at the city level. Uh, he's going to be our moderator for today. But uh, I don't know how long he's going to be, so I'm just going to kick things off. Uh, so we are in kind of like a, a new era of, uh, of legislation. We have the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. We have the jobs, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law. And so I think it would be best if probably this panel kicked things off. Uh, we'll start with you, Sam, and then I'm going to take a seat and hope Tim comes back. Here he is. <laughs> Tim, I told, I told everyone you were doing your job, so thank you for doing your job. Um, I'm going to let Tim take things from here because he's much better than I am uh, at kicking off a policy discussion. So uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, can everybody hear me? Oh, thank you, Daniel, and thank you all for uh, participating. Um, I thought tomorrow, uh, this morning's discussion on industrial decarbonization did a wonderful job for setting the stage for our discussion here. I thought particularly the reference uh, to the New Deal was particularly compelling. And if you think about this moment, the, the legislation that's passed combines almost a Apollo-like commitment to invest in research and innovation related to energy, clean energy and industrial decarbonization with a New Deal scale commitment to transform the nature of markets and industry in the United States. And the panel we have today are individuals who are both thought leaders and on the front lines of driving uh, this exciting period. So we're going to dig right in. Uh, and as Daniel suggested, I'm going to ask each panelist, and we'll, we'll start here with you, actually, and, and proceed down the line uh, to talk about, from their perspective, what critical gaps have been closed by the recent legislation, particularly the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Innovation and Jobs Act, and what are the new opportunities they see emerging from this great uh, legislative and policy opportunity? Uh, thank you so much. Um, and first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here and to, to share with all of you our perspectives. Um, by way of kind of background and perspective, I've been dedicated to the CCS space for 20 years. I've been trying to get CO2 in the ground. Um, and I'm now speaking from Carbon America. We are doing two things. We are developing a carbon capture technology. Brian showed earlier the picture of the National Carbon Capture Center. Our technology was lifted onto its risers last Thursday down there at the test center. So we're developing a capture technology, but we're also developing projects, technology agnostic. Our remit is go find good CCS projects and make them great. And that's an amazing, powerful mission to have. So what opportunities has the legislation created for us? So we've talked already about, a bit today about the 45Q tax credit for carbon capture and sequestration. There's been a tax, that tax credit has been in place for quite a long time. It was originally at $35 a ton, not really enough to get, to get projects off the ground and running. Um, and then in, in 2018, it was raised to $50 a ton. All right, we're kind of off to the races. And then what happened in the most recent legislation is that value was raised from $50 a ton to $85 a ton. Now let's talk about kind of where those numbers came from. They came from the marginal abatement cost curve of the United States and the expectations of what it would take to apply carbon capture and sequestration to those facilities. 
if you put all those economics together and kind of stack them up on your MAC curve, you know, you can kind of draw some lines. And there was kind of a line there around 50 and a line there around 85. Um, and so that kind of informs some of these, these original kind of thresholds. However, we had COVID, inflation, supply chain issues, and ever increasing stakeholder costs. And so whereas we got us up to $85, but really that's kind of more like maybe, I don't know, $60. So it got us part of the way there, but not all of the way there. One of the other things that is fantastic that happened in the Inflation Reduction Act is this has been a tax credit for a long time. That means you need a pretty big tax bill. And unfortunately, there aren't that many people with that big a tax bills other than a kind of a few large major banks. Tax equity hasn't exactly given kind of the CCS industry the, the favorable you know, policies and, and commercial structures that they were expected to. And so we've been asking for it to be a direct pay or kind of refundable tax credit so you don't have to deal with that tax liability. And within the Inflation Reduction Act, they did allow, allow kind of five years of direct pay before tapping into that tax equity market. However, it's not accounting for the time value of money and how tax equity works because tax equity is still actually more favorable than direct pay, um, you know, in an NPV terms. So it certainly kind of shifted the cost curve a little bit for the carbon capture and sequestration world, um, but not as significantly as we might have thought. The other interesting thing it's done is you know, the, you see these incentives and you see a lot of the oil and gas companies going after it and people have this perception that CCS is this high margin thing like oil and gas. That's a pretty incorrect mis um, uh, perception. Um, so we're doing quite a bit of work to try to recalibrate expectations there. But the, the legislation has been phenomenal in driving kind of the, the momentum and the interest in, in the space. Thanks so much, that's a great start to our dialogue, as noted today, so much of the industrial decarbonization landscape begins with CCS, so thank you for that. Abby, your perspective, you, you bring a, a position that's really at the intersection of so many different levels of government, business, and, and regions and local areas. What's your sense of the gaps and opportunities that are emerging? Um, Abby Smith, it's nice to meet all of you. Uh, <laughs> I will say that my perspective is really informed by, you know, the, the seat that I hold. So uh, I'm not sure whether you know about Team PA. You may have heard us in the news more, fre more recently and frequently because we're the prime applicant on a hydrogen hub application. Um, but uh, we're a statewide public-private partnership. We're a nonpartisan 501c3. The governor sits as the co-chair of our board, and we have public sector leaders that sit with private sector leaders. Um, the goal of the organization is to accelerate economic growth through public-private partnership. And there's really no better space and, and test case for when the, what the organization was kind of set to do than I think in the energy work, where there are just a number of issues that can't be tackled by any individual entity or sector. It really does demand some cross-sector collaboration that's messy and complicated, um, and it requires folks working in a pre-competitiveness space, a lot of times companies and organizations that are really not well equipped to, to work together, uh, government and business has you know, their own unique challenges on, on what makes that very hard to do. <clears throat> so when I think about you know, what is it that the huge pieces of legislation that have led to crazy investments are really teeing up and how I'm thinking about this, so much of it is that um, I don't know that that necessarily simplifies things, right? If anything, everybody kind of trying to figure out, you know, who's going to say something first, who's going to be a first mover, you know, are they, are, where are they going to do something? And we find as a as kind of a trusted neutral broker sitting at the state level in a lot of these conversations, uh, I was getting a lot of these calls from companies and from government and from all different parties saying, like, do you know, is someone going to submit something? You know, what's happening? Um, it's not as if that created clarity. And yet the, what the U.S. Department of Energy is looking for is collaborations. I think they recognize also the work can't be done by single entities. The projects require complex collaborations. Um, and so I think where it's created opportunities, where it's accelerated, yes, you know, the dollars are there and it's exciting. But I think we have to be realistic about the fact that these are really expensive undertakings. And the dollars, as big as the numbers are, are actually not enough to get the work done. We just have to be realistic about that. And so it requires a lot of people kind of figuring out how to 
pool together very complicated uh, projects and opportunities, knowing that oftentimes we're in regions that are ripe for this kind of activity, where we're motivated by how we achieve decarbonization goals in the industrial sector. Uh, partners are kind of ready to do that. And you have projects that are hopefully a little more shovel ready than they are in the science project stage. Um, but at the same time, to close that gap, uh, knowing that off takers are not necessarily ready yet either. It's, it's just a, everybody's a little scared to be kind of a first, uh, you know, the first go. Um, and so putting the big shiny object out there from the federal government meant, means that everybody's scrambling a little bit. I think for us, this creates and, and really demands a role for all of the organizations, whether it's community, local, regional organizations, state level organizations, national organizations, to continue to just convene and bring people together. How any work gets done depends heavily on the relationships that we forge and how somebody actually lives within their own communities. Um, and so what I hope this does is accelerate also the way in which people are forced to work with one another <laughs> and connect with one another. Um, hopefully that happens in much more productive ways than not. Um, and we certainly will keep that table very much open to partners and stakeholders who care about what happens in terms of Pennsylvania's economic growth and achieving those decarbonization goals. Um, but I really hope that this both does the acceleration that it's intended to do, these huge investments, um, and, and that then what it really creates is less about what individual projects get funded and the relationships that then become a starting point and a foundation for future projects, for future activities, and, and quite frankly, where there's real shared goals for what happens in a community. Um, and that, to me, is a much deeper and more important foundation and investment uh, that this is going to spur than, than just a particular project. Thanks so much, Abby. Thank you so much. And your, your point about this huge federal investment is, is amazing, but not enough for the task at hand. It's a natural transition to Stephen, who brings great insights on capital markets and, and the dynamics of capital for this era. So Stephen, what's your, your sense of what the, the uh, gaps and, and opportunities are with the new bills? Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for having me. Um, so I'm with, uh, with S2G, which is a, a family of funds focused on three transitions, the uh, sustainable food and ag transition, the ocean transition, and the energy transition. And I'm uh, one of the co-heads of the, of the energy piece of the puzzle. Um, we, we have a very interesting structure in that um, all of the, the capital comes from a, a single source, a um, uh, member of the, the Walton family. And um, so there's a lot of philanthropic work that, uh, that happens as well. And so one of the things that, you know, that, that differentiates our approach on the, on the capital deployment side is that you know, we look for this, what we call you know, flywheel effect of you know, learning from, from insights that we're seeing on the philanthropic side. Um, some, some fund investments that um, some of my colleagues are doing and some of the direct investments that we're doing. Um, Addressing specifically the question around, around um, the IRA and, and, and the new policy uh, framework, um, I think what, is, you know, what that has provided is, uh, is, is really a, a long-term pathway and a long-term security for investment. Um, it's you know, stating, stating the obvious as an investor, if you're, you know, if you're looking to deploy capital in capital-intensive industries, uh, in, you know, when you're making something that's a, that's a commodity, like, like an electron, um, then really what, what you're looking to do is you need long-term financing um, to make that um, as cost-effective and as, as, and as economic. So having that, that long-term visibility is, is incredibly helpful. If you look at the history of, uh, of, of wind power, for example, in, in, in the U.S., um, that was very production tax credit driven, you know, and that legislation was like on and on again, off again, and you see flows into that industry sort of spike and then drop and spike and drop. Um, so, so having having that 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 long duration um, is is really very helpful. Um, the one thing that that we're doing some work around right now is um, we're we're both investing in the early stage, but then also uh, later on the growth side. And I think one of the things that 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 we find quite interesting is that you know people throw around very very large numbers around you know how much capital is available and you know certainly the government is making a lot of funding available but really when you peel back the onion a little bit and you look at how much capital is actually available for first of a kind plants how much capital is actually available on the growth side of things 
Um, I think it's, it's actually a lot less than, than you would think. Um, there are certainly pockets, um, especially on, in the early stage on the venture capital side for more asset-like businesses. You know, if you have a software platform to do something on the clean energy side, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be 50 or 100 funds coming knocking down your door uh, looking to put some money um, in, you know, into, into your company. But um, you know, if you're actually looking to, to, to build physical infrastructure and you know, you're working with a technology that's maybe slightly unproven, um, that's, you know, you're, you're solving really, really tough science problems. That's actually really hard and it's, it's actually really hard to find A, enough capital for it, um, and then B, also capital that has the right return expectation around that. So, um, you know, having, having a view on, um, on, on the right duration around that is really important. Um, and, then, and then finding excellent teams that can deploy it. And, you know, one of, one of the teams is, you know, sitting, sitting, you know, two seats over and, you know, another team is sitting in the, in the audience, uh, you know, at Electra. So we're, we're always very excited to, uh, you know, to find new, um, you know, new teams that are, uh, that are coming up with ingenious ways of, uh, of moving the energy transition forward. Thank you. And Destiny, you, your research and your work really focus on how these large-scale programs uh, impact individuals and, and communities. What's your sense of, of the gaps and opportunities emerging from, from the legislation? So who here remembers when there were all those shortages during COVID? Chicken wing incident, remember when we couldn't get chicken wings at the grocery store? I feel, yeah, toilet paper. Um, and I feel like for me, when I think about industrial decarbonization, when I talk with stakeholders, that is something that is a big concern because a lot of decarbonization involves electrification, right? And so when we're seeing these weather spikes like we saw in Texas, when we're seeing heat wave spikes that are rocking the grid, to me, that is one of the largest challenges that I see when we are trying to decarbonize these very large sectors that are very energy intensive. And I think that on the other hand, right, we have a lot of carbon uh, CCS, right, carbon capture and sequestration, which is great, but then there are conversations about what is that going to do to the cost of the, you know, materials that we're getting? What's that going to do to the actual cost of, you know, how much it's going to take to capture and store that in the ground? We want to make sure that communities are properly compensated. Um, which I think Ashley is like advocating for, which is great, but we also need to think about how those costs translate down to the consumers, right? Because at the end of the day, the companies are gonna wanna make their profits and customers are going to be the main ones that are going to be having to make sure the companies can get their profits. And so that is a lot of times where I'm um, thinking about the gaps and the opportunities. I love that the... Um, bipartisan infrastructure law and the IRA have, you know, um, provisions for bringing manufacturing on shore, but we get a lot of technology from overseas, right? And so when we're trying to insulate ourselves against disruptions internationally, right, I'm sure we remember when that canal ship got stuck, I couldn't get a couch for like months, right? And we're trying to insulate ourselves against those issues, but manufacturing things on shore is already so difficult. Um, and we need to have a lot of investments. And I think that's going to be great for jobs and, you know, bringing more jobs back into the U.S. But there also comes a challenge with paying more for those technologies. And there was a recent study in Detroit that showed low-income communities in their um, department stores and their little mom and pop shops, they didn't carry LED light bulbs. So if households already just can't get a sustainable light bulb, right, then now we have to ask ourselves other questions about, okay, what does this mean for them getting solar panels? What does this mean for them getting these other uh, technologies? And then for, in those communities, the industrial uh, parts there, right, how are we gonna make sure the grid is robust so that it's reliable as we are decarbonizing Right? How are we going to make sure that those communities are properly compensated for their support in decarbonizing? Because we got to store the carbon somewhere, right, under the ground, and rural communities are going to be one of the prime candidates for that. That's the high level. That was great. That was great. Thank you very much. Uh, and Sam, as, as our partner from West Virginia, you, you come from an institution with a 
long history of research in, across the spectrum of these technologies and, and energy areas. What's your, what's your perspective on, on the gaps and opportunities emerging from, from the bills? So uh, when, when we had our, our prep call for this uh, about a week ago, um, there was sort of some silence among the group. We're all kind of getting to know each other. And I broke the ice by saying terrified, uh, which might have been a little bit of an overshoot, you know, upon further reaction, sort of like starting a new job, um, excited but very nervous uh, as you kind of get into this. And, and the panels hit a lot of the stuff that I would bring up, you know, at the, the land grant institution in West Virginia, we have a role that crosses a lot of these. The, the, you know, honest broker role falls a lot to us. A lot of community engagement falls to us. And, and a lot of the conversations we're having touch these different pieces. The, the, the conversations about how capital intensive some of these projects may be, and then trying to manage expectations about that capital may not directly translate to gigantic job creation. It may be very capital intensive, but not very labor intensive. Um, trying to work our way through, you know, community engagement kind of concepts, you know, these big, these bigger concepts and the, the talking point I've been using in my meetings is that, you know, job creation goes a long way for, for community engagement, but it doesn't address the concerns of someone's worried about their well water. Uh, so, so that's the role we've been having to take. The university is trying to stay out in front of these things. And, and the reason I said terrified, I'll, I'll roll that back just a little bit, but, but I think that it's, it's exposed gaps kind of a layer deep. You know, we've had a decade, more than a decade, of asking for resources to do this stuff. You know, it's been, we could make this deployment, we could do it at scale, you know, trust us. Um, and so now the, the federal government has said, okay, bet. And uh, now, now we're all trying to pick this up and run and where, where it's highlighting for us, for example, and uh, Destiny mentioned a little bit of this, there's a, there's a program, the, uh, the MESC uh, 40209, which is a uh, clean energy manufacturing and, recycl and recycling program. It's targeted for energy impacted communities, uh, rural communities, so it's a great program for us. We're very interested in it. Trying to find folks that understand how the heck you put together a federal procurement package and understand how to be, uh, you know, pull together cost share and, and be federally compliant. That's a, that's a tall bar um, for us. And so we're, we're actively making investments with some of our friends down at Marshall University on, on a grant center uh, in West Virginia purely to try to get some of this capability out to the, the public. But it, those are the things that it's highlighted is we filled in one gap with a lot of money uh, and, then, and then highlighted a bunch of kind of structural gaps beneath of it. Can I, can I add something yes, there? Yes, please. I think that, you know, the, the legislation has done a tremendous amount to drive investment into kind of industry to go do these projects, right? That's what all these tax credits are. They're meant to pay for the projects. We completely forgot to incentivize the communities, right? All of the incentives are really pointed at the developers and then, you know, and, and we're going to have to work in our tails off to try to find enough margin to be able to give back to the communities they, in, this, in the kinds of ways that they want to be given back to. Um, and so I think that there's, there's a tremendous gap missing in incentives directly for communities. And, you know, it, it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of implemented via the community benefits package in the funding opportunity announcements. But we've already addressed that there's a pretty big hurdle to even be able to do those. So we need to be thinking, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, our speaker this morning was talking about, you know, do what's feasible now, but be thinking about what's necessary later. We need to be thinking about the necessary ways to motivate our communities to embrace our projects. And that goes, that goes beyond regular, just good stakeholder engagement. Thanks. Thanks for that addition. I'd like to uh, dig a little deeper on, on each of your comments and, and your expertise and and, and try to frame out in a little further these policy challenges. And I'm going to start at the other end. Uh, I'll start with you, Sam. Um, it was noted this morning, I think, really, really quite accurately in the panel that while the policies are obviously framed around specific levels of government and specific agencies, the, the energy dynamics aren't, aren't held to state boundaries. And so, Sam, could you think Give us some thoughts on how we create the policy context for what is what will be need to be um, cross state and regional uh, initiatives. That's that's a great one, and some stuff that Abby and Ashley and I've been talking about along the way here. The 
the need for, in our region in particular, the need for interstate collaboration, I mean, it's at an all-time high. We've always needed to do it. The, the tri-state or even quad-state region is so interconnected with the industries, with infrastructure, with all that, that it, it makes a lot of sense. But as we get into the details of these projects, I mean, I've, I've done some direct work on, you know, carbon policy. And just, you know, as soon as the, if the pipeline or the infrastructure crosses a state line, that can be, that can be kiss of death right there, just in terms of navigating multiple permitting processes and these kinds of things. So, so you know, if I can make a plea to the room or folks, can, I know there's some elected folks here to help me carry water uh, across the Mason-Dixon line here, you know, thinking about how we can engage in some of these cross-state discussions you know, to, to try to harmonize policies or find ways for the states to, to collaborate and cooperate um, to get these projects because, you know, we, Wheeling, Wheeling is not that far from Pittsburgh, um, but, you know, it's a completely different universe from a, a regulatory and permitting perspective. So it's, I, could, I could talk about this for hours, Tim, but there's, you know, this has been a, a conversation for the last, since all of this started to launch, the, the carbon hubs, the hydrogen hubs, the, everything around rural, you know, electricity, it, it touches these understanding what's going on with PJM and the Q and solar build outs and how that's different across the states. It, it just, every project we pick up, this is a conversation that we have to have, it seems like. In, in areas like CCS, where, where the geology will define some of these state roles and, and roles of different communities, that creates yet another dimension of, of challenge for how we not only collaborate as a region, but we, we communicate, you know, as a region on what this opportunity is. Th thanks so much. Destiny, I think in your, your opening remarks, you really touched on what is, you know, a key thread throughout the legislation, which is the desire for, for all of these major programs to have a transformative impact on, on the lives of individuals uh, and, and the communities they live in. And, and the desire of really all of us working at the policy domain to keep that as a central focus. I wonder, just digging a little deeper, maybe focus on uh, your thoughts on specifically, you know, how, how we ensure that these policies deliver clean energy at a, at a price point that is creating, a, enables individuals and communities to uh, have new economic opportunities and, and how we relate some of these dynamics to addressing kind of historical environmental impacts in those areas as well. So I think that one challenge with the way that our policies are currently implemented is that we are often doing it in silos, right? So we target a policy at the energy sector, then we target a policy at the industrial sector, then we'll target one at the transportation sector. And that's just not how it works for like the impact on an individual's life. And so I do think that having more community leaders at the table when these policies are made is so important in thinking about how they're implemented. Um, so when we're thinking about uh, Cancer Alley, for example, where there's a lot of industrial plants along the waterways and how, you know, it's not just one plant, but it's the fact that there are um, at least 10 plants along the same waterway, and that's what's, you know, really destroying their water and their health. Um, you know, that is one thing that I kind of think of, of like if we were actually working at the intersection of, okay, let's look at where the largest combined detriment is to a community, and let's go target that piece of the industrial sector first. I think sometimes we're looking just for the single largest emitter and we're gonna go take down that one plant, but then there are communities where there are, you know, 15 small plants that are uh, negatively impacting those individuals. Um, and then sometimes the barrier isn't that the, the community, like sometimes the community wants to decarbonize, but other times the backbone of the electricity sector is not strong enough to support electrifying multiples of these power plants, right? And so then it can become very expensive when you upgrade the power line to decarbonize one plant, and then you have to upgrade the same exact line to decarbonize the next power plant. Um, most of my work is at the individual level, so I'll, I'll just give you the example that I take from my rental property. This is my poverty immersion research here. Um, so I became a landlord and we wanted to electrify the stove, right? And so I had to call, I had one guy that would come out and do all the wires for the stove. 
And I was like, oh, well, if you're going to come out anyways, can you do the uh, heating system? He's like, no, that's a different guy, right? So then I would have to call one guy to rewire my house for the stove and a different guy to rewire my house for the uh, heating and air conditioning system. And I would have to call a different guy to put in a request to get an electric vehicle at that rental property. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to keep the natural gas stove, right? And I'm in electrification. But when I did the cost for that, it was like seven grand. And buying another stove was $500, right? And so when we're thinking about these power plants, there are things that will make it easier to decarbonize, but oftentimes it's going to bridge into another industry. And that's something that I feel like we really need to bring into our conversation when we are crafting policies as opposed to staying in our silos. Can I build on that a moment? Um, Destiny, you captured exactly why Carbon America exists. Um, we, we, we developed our, so well, we were developing the capture technology and then looking for a deployment partner and realizing how many different pieces of the chain you had to pull together and how many parties it takes to get a CCS project done. And that's why we just said, you know what, we'll do it. We'll do the vertical integration, we'll cover the entire value chain. It's kind of cheesy to say, but we're the easy button for CCS because we recognize that that is one of the things that is, is a huge hurdle for, for CO2 sources to decarbonize, being able to kind of work with one dedicated company who understands how to manage across those different elements. Destiny hit, hit a piece of this too. I mean, it's the, the other thing we, we keep crashing into with, you know, the deployment to, to people on the ground is that, the, the metrics for a lot of these programs are, are efficiency metrics. It's a you know, dollar ton CO2 abated or something. And in a lot of cases, the, the highest impact that you may have for, for a house or for a family or for a community may not be the most efficient solution. Um, and, and I think the agencies in particular are, you know, back to, to a pure policy question, I think the agencies are really struggling with what's the, you know, you've turned in your proposal, great, how do I score you? Um, because the because these metrics can be really opposed to each other. You know, it may not be great on a dollar per kilowatt hour basis, but it impacts you know seven thousand low income houses. You know, it's like how how do we metric these things? That's something we've we've been talking a ton about just in in my direct work. But it's just I keep wanting to highlight that issue <laughs> any chance we get. Yeah. So then uh, I'll just respond to some of those. Um, I think that one of the challenges is, you know, so the Biden administration had their Justice 40 initiative where they said 40% of the benefits from these investments need to go to disadvantaged communities. But one of the big challenges is that it's really hard to collect data in disadvantaged communities because they don't have the automatic data collection software in their houses. And that's one of the reasons why they're disadvantaged, right? And so understanding like the baseline of where are the negative impacts and then trying to find solutions to um, make co-benefits. So for example, when we're thinking about trying to store sequestered carbon underneath the ground in the South, one of the largest challenges is that many people do not have sewage disposal, right? Now, I don't know if you guys have ever been near an open sewage line, but it's literally just poop in, on your yard, okay? So that's what they have right now as their septic tanks, right? It's just a septic yard. Um, and so one benefit from that would be to actually, you know, co-build, like we're, when we're digging underneath the ground, to actually in institute like some sewage lines, right? And that's a co-benefit that could be added um, with these policies, but because the waste sector is, you know, held very separately from the energy sector, even though they are very linked because uh, processing our waste takes so much energy, um, and that's one of, you know, one of our larger industries as well, right? That could be a co-benefit that these communities would benefit from that we miss when we are doing things individually. I want to try and just, just continue this thread once more. And so this is a question for anyone. All of you are working in these large program areas, the hub programs, the earth shots, and so forth. Uh, Really what Destiny is highlighting here is, is the need for a, a policy and process design that's far more inclusive at all stages than perhaps anything we've undertaken before. As you work through these big new programs, are you seeing like the seeds or the signs that the structure is taking hold where we can create this kind of an inclusivity? Just to anyone who kind of wants to explore that and, and break, break through these silos that are both 
sectoral, community-based, and, and, and uh, technology-based as well. Any, any takers on that? Maybe just quickly. Um, so, so those silos, I, you know, that's a great point. We talk about sort of the, the siloing and the, the, the negative effects of siloing. And you can apply that to many different things. You know, capital is very siloed as well, if you think about that. Um, w one of the, the programs that, that we're um, a, a part of is the uh, Breakthrough Energy Catalyst Program. So that's a, that's a program that basically looks to do, you know, elephant hunting, large projects, you know, 100 million and above. Uh, of projects in things like uh, green hydrogen, uh, long duration storage, uh, industrial decarbonization. Um, and, and, and one of the big things that we found is that, you know, it brings together a variety of, of financial institutions and funding organizations, but it also brings together large industrial partners. And so if you think about the green premium that is associated, you know, that's sort of why, why you know, why this is not the status quo. One of the things around that is, is completely structural and contracting. It has nothing to do with incentives or anything like that. It's really just that uh, you know, certain industries are used to buying things on the spot. They're not used to buying things on long-term contracts. And if you have long-term contracts, you can finance it more cheaply versus just buying, buying it spot. So one of the things, uh, one of the first uh, projects that, um, that was funded through that, that program is in sustainable aviation fuels. And a big part of that was just airlines coming forward and saying, yes, we will, we will give you a, a long-term offtake contract for this plant that you're building. It's essentially a form of vendor financing. Um, and that had nothing to do with incentives or anything. It was just changing how you're contracting and bringing people from different parts of the value chain, from different parts of the silos together um, around one table and, you know, and, and, and hammering that out. So, um, there's, there's, there's obviously lots to be done around, you know, policy and around funding, but there's also just a lot of those things around, you know, w working across those silos and thinking around, you know, how, you know, very, very basic contracting structures work. So, you know, as an, as an engineer, you know, I, 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 I like to go and, you know, look at these, at these technical problems, but, you know, it looks like sometimes need the, need the lawyers as well, uh, you know, to make sure that, that it all hangs together. Uh, just an, an observation that right after right after Ira passed, um, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers did a webinar on on some of the new incentives um, for targeted at startups. And so I joined the call, and it was a huge variety of startups. You know, I I think about 45Q, and I knew that there was this other thing that might be applicable to some of our projects. But what I discovered on that call was just number number letter. There are so many different incentives out there, and it's just such a numerical alphabet soup that I feel like it's almost kind of, it's, it's, it's enforcing some of those silos more than it's actually breaking things down. And so I think that's where, you know, thinking of more universal policies that could allow kind of the, the real optimization, to, which is actually reducing CO2 emissions, right? I think we need to think broadly about kind of the implications of those, those incentives that we rolled out and how, how, how complex they are. That's... The, the next panel up, I think, talk, talks on some of these issues. But yeah, I think the, the big surprise for some of our partners and the corporate partners, there's a lot of willingness in the engagement. The, the labor intensivity, <laughs> how much time, you know, back to the conversations, you, you have to spend the time and, and get the relationships built before you have genuine engagement. And I, and I think there's been maybe a little bit of surprise, you know, with some of these larger deployments. They would just go do community, community engagement. And it's like, well, we, we had one town hall meeting and people threw stuff at us, you know, are they engaged? Um, no, that's not what you're looking for in these projects. So, so just trying to get that explanation too, that it's, it's time and it's genuine engagement. You know, some, some of the work we're doing in Southern West Virginia is the, the stuff we're doing with Coalfield Development Corp is just so hinged on, you've got to be there and you've got to be there for the long haul to make this stuff work. And, and I think to that point, actually, um, that this is, while there's a very quick effort here, right? Federal government puts out a lot of dollars. There's policies that we have to figure out. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot. But ultimately, I think that we have to be 
you know, as patient as we can be about the fact that this is going to be very messy. And it's actually going to take a long time for these projects to ultimately be deployed. There's going to be a lot of change along the way. And rather than it being kind of unidirectional, you know, we are sharing feedback with, that there's, there's these moments of just messy, bi-directional, you know, feedback loop that needs to happen. Um, and I think that the inclusivity around where the policy comes from. Well, government's actually really men and better designed to be reactive. And so I actually think that these, you know, as these start to play out and as you start to see, hopefully, deeper community engagement, deeper back and forth, that with that comes, uh, you know, inclusive policy through kind of a coalition of the willing. And these are going to be community members and organizations and companies and, you know, a whole slew of different partners uh, but that that is not going to be a, uh, a clear path. That's going to be kind of, you know, we all have this very big, and I, and I actually think somewhat shared vision around what, what the long-term kind of ocean might look like. And we're over here and we are all kind of looking at that. And that the, the path that river takes is going to have a lot of tributaries and a lot of circuitous paths. Um, and then we have to have some patience for that. That doesn't mean, though, that we have any less urgency in how we go about it. Um, and I think that counts for the policy. It counts for the engagement. It's, it's on a couple different levels. And then if we're just kind of keeping, you know, that eye on the prize there, uh, we're going to get to a better place along the way. Yeah, it's, it is so critical to have counterparties that are aligned on this, because if you're not really aligned on that mission, those bumps and bruises are going to kill projects left and right. It's absolutely critical. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, I'd like to return to the capital discussion uh, for a minute, you go a little, dig a little deeper. You talked about how the, the legislation has really created this framework for how large federal investments are incentivizing new venture and, and market-based financing tools. Could you elaborate a little further on you know, what are the areas where you see the legislation creating you know, a, a plentiful supply of capital? Where are, are some of the gaps that you see as most critical? And should we be thinking of, you know, new policy approaches or tweaks that might specifically get at, get at some of these gaps? Um, yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, that, that's a good point. The, the thing that's, that I find so fascinating, um, you know, I've been in this, in this space for, for the better part of, of two decades, and you know, the, the, the space has really moved very, very quickly, right? If you, you know, the, the, the challenge may seem very daunting, but if you actually step back and you think about, you know, where solar and wind investment was in the U.S. 20 years ago and where it is today. So, you know, I think we also need to acknowledge that, you know, great progress has been made and great progress continues being made. Um, but one of the, the things that, that um, you know, to that point that um, I, I find quite, quite fascinating is that now, you know, back in the day, it used to be called, you know, renewable energy or sustainable energy, you know, today sort of the moniker of, of, of the day is energy transition. Um, and there's now a, a lot of specific energy transition focused funds, you know, we're, we're one of them. Um, our, our mandate is relatively broad, but I do, I do find um, very interestingly myself in conversations very often with some of my colleagues you know, where, you know, we've invested in, you know, in Carbon America on the CCS side. We've recently also invested in, in, a, in another company that, um, that, that mines for, uh, for various metals uh, required uh, for, for car batteries. You know, and I was, I was sharing this investment opportunity with a colleague of mine and they said, oh, you know, like, we can't invest in that, you know, because mining is like outside of scope for my energy transition fund. And it's, and so, so I think there's, you know, it comes back to the silo point, right? Like, there's, there's a question around, you know, what, what, is, what is the policy framework? But there's also then the question of, like, what is, you know, how are, you know, how are pension funds, how are insurance companies allocating into these different funds? And what are the, what are the laws and the restrictions that they're putting in place um, when they're signing up these funds? And, are they, you know, very often this is being done with the best of intentions, but sometimes the details, you know, the devil's in the detail and, and you, you see that you're actually, you know, that, that an energy transition fund actually struggles to, uh, you know, to invest in some really key areas of the energy transition. And so it comes back to the point that you were making, um, uh, Abby, just around the, um, you know, the back and forth, the messiness um, and, and uh, you know, and, and the, the several iterations that it may take for, you know, for it to get right. 
Um, and so we're participating um, in, in a lot of feedback sessions with, uh, you know, with the DOE, with the Department of Treasury around, um, you know, around, around all of these different um, specific, uh, the, the alphabet soup, Ashley, as you said it, um, you know, coming out of the IRA, because that's, that's what it is, right? Like you got, you know, the, the pathway is, is charted in the right way, and now you've just got to make sure that you're blocking and tackling. I would imagine part of this dynamic is, is cultural, it, not only financing tools, but the cultural interface as, you, you know, venture capitalists bringing, you know, a, a particular focus and a, and a great history of driving disruptive technologies and then having to partner with very much more traditional industries driven, driven by different finan uh, financial indicators and different objectives. Are, have you found, how do you find that, that bridging those cultural divides and uh, lessons of success and so forth there. Yeah, um, well, it, it sort of takes a village, right? So, so it, it, you know, you, you need all of the early stage venture capital to get these, these ideas off the ground. Um, but then really what you need, you know, if you want to get large scale infrastructure built, you really need, you know, project finance, you need large industrial organizations with large balance sheets. Um, and, and those people have very different return expectations. Um, and those people also, you know, very often don't speak the same language. I mean, we're we're in conversations, uh, you know, not, not not to not to name any names, but the, you know, we're having conversations about you know some pilot plans or some some builder plans, and you know, we're saying, okay, that's great, you know, like what EPC contractors are you using? You know, how are you thinking about warranties? What about liquidated damages? You know, and you know, it's like deer in the headlight, right? It's like so. It, it, it you know you you gotta you gotta work together and there's different different skill sets that are coming together and um, we were uh, we just came back from uh, from Sarah Week in Houston a couple of weeks ago where a lot of oil and gas uh, you know companies are there and there's actually a lot of really great engineering skill set project management skill sets that are coming out of these these industries I mean if you you know if you think about like what industry knows how to deploy billions of dollars of capital in very challenging technologies in very you know, challenging parts of, you know, of the globe, it's probably the mining industry and, you know, and the oil and gas industry. So let's, let's make sure that we're, you know, that we're capturing that talent and that, that we're using that talent and applying it to, you know, where, where we would like to, to, to see it in the energy transition. Stefan, that's, you just killed that. The, the discussion there, we, we've seen that and we've tried to help break through and get them to, to talk with folks like you where they're, they're so, uh, you know, they're brave in technology risk in some areas, things that drive production, things that drive efficiency. They're excited about that. But then on the financial side of the business or things that start to get to the edges of their business space, ultra, ultra risk averse. And, and we see that in the, if you get into medium size or smaller sized businesses, they get even more risk averse, even though maybe some of the payoff discussions are easier, you know, to justify because it's not as big an investment. So it's trying to have and, and build more of these discussions with folks on the financing side of the universe, I think are gonna be massive because there's a lot of sell me and I can be convinced, but my risk <laughs> tolerance is not built for how fast the world is moving. And, and I think that's a, a risk for us just across the whole region. Yeah, one thing I'll also add to that is that making, I feel like in the past sustainability and economic discussions were separate. Um, one of the companies I'm involved with is called DevStream, and they've been like looking at carbon offset credits, right? And I think that carbon offset credits have gotten bad rap in terms of the nature-based credits. Um, I think that there's been a push for technology-based credits that are you know, more verifiable, more transparent. How are these things being calculated? And that's something that I'm actually really excited about moving forward, and I hope that that can actually help, you know, make this transition uh, more economical, because I think in the past, these carbon offset credits have been used to say, okay, you've done the project, and now we'll give you the credits. But if they were already going to do the project without the credits, those are not who needs the credits, right? We need to give the credits to people who would not have done those projects otherwise, um, and that's something that I'm hoping to see more of, like as these policies deploy, of that these credits will then start to incentivize uh, the companies, maybe like the medium, right, smaller firms that are going to have a harder time to decarbonize just because they don't have as wide of a customer base potentially. But then 
that can then help their financials and reduce some of that risk. However, we find that most CO2 sources that are interested in decarbonizing want to keep those, those emissions reductions credits the, to themselves, right? And, and you know, if, there, if there's a compliance mandate that is going to come into picture in the future, you know, with emissions reductions, then that kind of obviates the voluntary carbon credit space. So I think, I think there's a, I would call the, vol, the carbon credit space very frothy. And, um, and, and I think it's, it's, I think we're probably going to see, see some consolidation and reconciliation across these markets because it's, um, that they're, and they're all approaching it very differently, and it's less accessible and less useful in, in projects than people might think. Great, thank you. Abby, just shifting a little bit, um, I think looking at the, the complexity of the policy environment that the discussion has brought out already, you know, one could almost say that success is going to depend upon a reinvigoration, if not a reimagination, of, of American federalism and interaction at federal, state, and local level, and, and then how local areas come together as regions. And much of your work at Team PA has been helping to focus on this stitching dynamic here. So could you talk a little bit about some of the challenges in, in that domain, everything from how we, how, how we create a policy environment that builds capacity at various levels of government, and how we blend policy change with the, the current mission and activities of, at, at each of these levels that are still, still vital. I, I'm going to sound like I'm deviating, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to your question. And believe it or not, there's going to be a theme around home improvement here. But um, I, <laughs> uh, I, I, I have an old house, and uh, someone put in an AC system before we moved in. Um, and they got a huge like commercial unit that they put in, and they put in ductwork, and they put in a unit that was way too big for our home, and ductwork that was just by diameter way too small. <laughs> um, and I feel like that's kind of what's happening, <laughs> that, uh, that there is this, and, and the whole, the, whole the, it, the system shut down. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, that, you know, we're doomed. But, but this is a, a crazy infusion of dollars and an inflection point, and, you know, the, the, you can't even, uh, you know, read two sentences into somebody's executive summary on some of this without kind of hearing generational and magnitude and the stakes are high, right? Uh, and yet the ductwork is actually really small. <laughs> uh, it's, it's too small in diameter um, at the state and the federal level, despite the fact that states and federal governments really want to see this work take off and they want to incent it in the right way and they want to have the policy environment to make that happen. Uh, but that doesn't make the dynamics of that, the mechanics of that any different. Uh, it really is the case that we're going to shove a heck of a lot of projects and applications and attempts and all this into, a, into some ductwork that's a little too narrow. And so I think, you know, when I think about what I'd love to see, a lot of it is making sure that we have the necessary capacity at the state and federal level uh, to do this work well. Uh, and that doesn't mean that suddenly we need, you know, to just kind of have this crazy inflated number of, of workers. But I will say that for the students in the room who are wondering, where can I really make a difference in a future career? Uh, your government needs you. <laughs> uh, and this is really a great moment and an inflection at that moment when the stakes are this high and we are so motivated. Uh, doing this well depends heavily also on our systems being ready for it. Um, and I think that as we start to make that policy and regulatory environment, you know, Sarah talked about this earlier on the panel around, uh, you know, we have a lot of rules around how we get stuff out. We don't have a lot of rules on <laughs> the whole putting it back and moving it around. And, uh, and we're going to need to create that. And the way in which we do that actually really depends on a lot of people with .gov email addresses uh, who have a lot of talent and thought and are coming from different perspectives and community. And so I, I hope that this is a moment where we see a lot of talent going into government work so that we do this work well, because they are actually really critical partners in how we create the kinds of uh, policy that we want to see. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. But now you know a little too much about my, my house. But <laughs> that, no, that, I couldn't think of a better example. And, and in the question period, we'll take recommendations on HVAC vendors for Abby too, but no, that was a beautiful, beautiful analogy. And I, I really like your point. Every great period of, of transformation has generally motivated a generation to come into governmental service. And uh, I think that's incumbent on all of us in universities to be part of 
generating that motivation with this incredibly talented generation of students that are, that are here now. So, so yes, thank you for that. Ashley, I'll turn to you to go a little deeper in, in your area of expertise and again, reflecting how central CCS is as a starting point for industrial decarbonization. Can you just reflect on the, the evolution of CCS? We've lived through periods of large federal programs, pilot initiatives. How have those brought us to the moment we're in right now? And, and what, do they, what do they tell us about the path forward? Oh yeah, thank you. Um, so if I think about kind of the eras of CCS, and if we think back, remember the climate change wedges? Remember the climate change wedges? Kind of here's the here's the emissions reduction. Here's the emissions. We need to reduce this much, and here are kind of the different contributions of different kinds of technologies. Um, and you know, within that within that those climate change wedges, carbon capture and sequestration was a part of it. And within those wedges themselves, if you looked at the different CCS applications large coal-fired power and saline and, and storage in deep saline formations and particularly sandstone formations, those were the biggest wedge. And so that's where a tremendous amount of funding went and why we had projects like Future Gen, kind of these really advanced projects. This was also a time when capital was really cheap, right? This is before the economic crash. You could go do a $2 billion project, not that terrifying. And then we saw what happened with the economic collapse, right? And, and, and ARRA, the, the, um, the, the Stimulus Act then pumped a bunch of money into the CCS community to try to keep it going. However, what, what happened is they put a bunch of capital grants in place for these projects, but they were counting on cap and trade legislation providing ongoing revenue. What we have now is actually kind of flipped. We got 45Q to provide ongoing, ongoing income, and then we had you know, a bill, and especially IRA, coming with big capital grants. However, as we kind of watch, there's a tremendous amount of learnings that can be done from, from those eras, right? Because the government pumped a bunch of money into CCS, and it kind of collapsed, right? Um, and, and the entire CCS world got really, really quiet because all of a sudden, the projects that you know, were doable were no longer doable. They were too big, they were too complex, that we were jumping from A to Z in technology spaces. So there's a tremendous amount of learning, and we kind of collapsed to what was economic. There were a few projects, mostly natural gas, kind of a couple projects actually got done, right? So we had kind of that era of the science-driven by the wedges, the government driven, you know, with all of that funding, and then it collapsed into that economic, you know, the few projects that could actually pencil. And I think that now what we're entering into is an era where this entirely hinges on social acceptance. We've been at those inflection points before when we didn't know, is CCS gonna take off? Is it gonna collapse? We are still at an inflection point. And if you are watching many of the headlines in the CCS world, it's starting to get a little bit tough out there, right? There's a tremendous amount because of poor stakeholder engagement, because of lack of direct incentives to the stakeholders, there's a tremendous amount of animosity being generated and a tremendous amount of misunderstanding of what CCS is. So I think we're now in that era of very kind of whatever is socially acceptable is, is gonna kind of win the day. And even policies like eminent domain, North Dakota has had some of the best policies for CCS because of poor stakeholder engagement and lack of appropriate incentives, there's now a bunch of bills undoing these favorable policies sitting in their legislature. So we need to be really thoughtful and mindful of how we roll these projects out and building up that social confidence. And that's, and that's doing the bite-sized local projects, keep the benefits and externalities close. Our announced project in Nebraska, it's a four mile pipeline community is really excited about it. It's a huge economic engine for, for the area, that ethanol plant, right? We need to be thinking about the, the projects that we're doing and, and building that social credibility before we start doing massive scale projects and really large infrastructure. Great. Thank you. That was a great description of both of how the technological challenges have been met, but now open up fundamentally issues that are inherently cultural. And I want to shift before we're, we're going to soon get to questions from the audience, but I want to ask kind of a couple, two open-ended questions. But let me start with, I think Ashley's comments really underscore, and, and each of you have in your remarks, that decarbonization really has to be embraced at a cultural, in a cultural dimension. 
So any thoughts, and open to anyone, any thoughts on specific strategies you've seen that can really accelerate you know, a focus on building the cultural dimensions of decarbonization, which span everything from community engagement to workforce development to uh, really a receptive and responsive uh, state and local policy environment. Any, any lessons from your individual experiences that kind of speak to how we tackle this fundamental cultural dimension? I, I can address a bit from the CCS perspective. Um, Going out and talking to a bunch of farmers about climate change doesn't always get them excited about a project. Going and talking to them about kind of climate protecting that economic engine in their community, that does resonate with them. In other communities, you know, some of the communities we'd love to develop our CCS projects in have some of the worst air quality. And CCS has tremendous co-benefits in cleaning up a lot of other environmental stuff. And we should all be watching the Clean Air Task Force. We'll soon, we've been waiting for it, soon be releasing a report specifically on the co-benefits of CCS and doing air dispersion modeling and modeling before and after application of CCS to identify and quantify the environmental benefits of CCS beyond climate. We as an industry have, have not done a great job of talking about that. And I think just now we're starting to see more and more emphasis going towards, um, towards promoting those environmental co-benefits. So I think that there's, it, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty location specific, pretty community specific. Um, but I think really focusing on it's not always all about climate and it's not always about, you know, big federal dollars. Sometimes it's about, you know, improving their air quality, you know, or providing indoor plumbing to them. Right, kind of meeting the communities where they're at. I think that one thing I'll add to that is that in the past, I've seen a lot of extractive community engagement where it's like, okay, we're gonna go survey the community and then we're gonna get all their thoughts and then we're gonna take it back to our team where there's nobody from that community on our team and then we're gonna come up with a solution and then we're gonna go back to the community and ask them for more of their time to tell us if they like the solution. Then we're gonna go back to our team, right? and people are not actively engaged in the process, right? They're not at the table the entire time. And I think that really compensating people for their time and bringing them into the team as a valuable member is something that I have been really inspired by by some of my you know, colleagues. So um, there's one, uh, Paulina Jaramillo, who works in the developing world, and she's really good at like being in the community and going back to the community and having them be involved in the design. You know, uh, Valerie, she's leading the industrial decarbonization here. And from the beginning, it's been, uh, sorry, Valerie Carplus, if you want to look her up. Um, and, you know, it's been about like, you know, how are we going to get these communities involved? Like, okay, what are the questions? Let's make sure that we're coming and really valuing their time. And I think that integrating the community into the process, the implementation, the evaluation, and having them be a part of those advisory boards where they are compensated for their time is something that is really important for community engagement. And I think that that is something that will help us reach a more equitable future moving forward. Fantastic. Really, I think your comments highlight we're almost thinking like a new era, a new generation of citizen science uh, that's far more, far more inclusive, more far reaching, and part of a broader uh, strategy for democratizing you know, the entire uh, technology development uh, in, in the energy area. Th thank you for that. Now, let me throw out one more for everyone. And, you know, I think all of us here, what, one thing that brings us all together is we believe that really the future of industrial decarbonization for the United States, if not the world, will, will proceed through this region. That this region, if this region doesn't lead and solve, solve the issue, that, that uh, we're the best hope for, for success. So could, if you could just reflect, if if you could imagine what the headline would be about industrial decarbonization in this region five years from now, what, what would you think that would be? Or, or what would be the key elements of that? And again, op open that up to, to anyone to think about. As you can see, I didn't give this in advance to anybody on the panel, but uh, opening it up, any, any thoughts or, or, or what would be the vision of what this region's decarbonization story would be five years from now? To me, it's got to be a kind of working together, growing together. Uh, and, um, you know, part of the reason why 
we're kind of being looked at is because there's a lot of the assets here and a lot of the people here and the workforce here and the dollars here and geology here and all these pieces. Um, but it's just a matter of how those ingredients come together. Um, and so I would think that the headline has to be an inclusive one of, around the way in which uh, partnerships were leveraged and these moments were capitalized on um, and done so in a way where uh, everybody really felt like they were uh, along for the ride and they could see themselves in that future vision. For, for us, it's going to be a big, a big play in, in a co-benefits kind of discussion. You know, the, how, how did these projects drive, you know, transformational change in communities, rural communities that needed it, um, and, and then provided, you know, benefits in infrastructure and grid availability and high-speed internet accessibility and these kinds of things that we know we need. And, and this, these infrastructure dollars provide a lot the way coal and gas did 100 years ago. You know, why do some of these towns exist where they do? infrastructure that they have exists is because this stuff came here and we built water lines and roads and, you know, power to these facilities. We're, we're now trying to, you know, clear the, clear the debris and the brush and follow that trail again a little bit and figure out how to bring this infrastructure back to these places um, that, that started with it 100 years ago. The history is the prologue. I guess um, one of the headlines might be the only region that actually achieved the Justice 40 initiative because we actually worked together and made sure the benefits went to the communities. I think that would be a nice headline in the future. Um, and I think that, you know, taking it back to the ultimate goal, right, like it's to make sure that there's a livable and sustainable community for all of us, right? And that is the ultimate goal of decarbonization. And I think that by working at the intersection and understanding the trade-offs of where we're winning and losing is going to be very important for that. Great, great insights. Anyone else? That was great. I think going back to the you know, wonderful observation this morning about the parallels to the New Deal, if we, if we walk around any of our communities, we can see you know, the vestiges, the remnants of, of things, infrastructure that was built by those acts. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see if a couple generations from now people can see the vestiges of a new infrastructure built by, by the bills in the last two years. Thank you all for this great discussion. I'd like to now turn and, and bring in the audience uh, to have a chance to ask questions of this incredible panel. Yeah, thank you, Tim, for moderating this great panel. Um, as with <clears throat> previous Q&A sessions, we want to make sure we prioritize a student for the first question. So do any students in the room have a first question they'd like to ask. Bueller. If you were taking my class, you'd get five extra points for. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll open it up to the entire floor. Does anybody have any questions for any of the panelists on stage? Hi, my name is Rudy Suto, and uh, thank you for your presentation. But I think that uh, what we're talking about here is somebody has to make a commitment, you know, and I think that like Carnegie Mellon could make a commitment by leading by example. For instance, you have a project here, uh, I think you run the steam plant from uh, the Belfield boiler plant all the way over to the uh, uh, what hospital is it over there? The Fall Clinic from there over here. All that steam and everything is made, you know, by Carnegie Mellon, the Carnegie Museum, and Pitt, University of Pittsburgh. All right, and I think it, that, uh, that since you own it, and the infrastructure money is available from, from Uncle Joe, that, uh, I just, you know, uh, Tim, did, did anybody in Carnegie Mellon apply for infrastructure to, fill, to replace the 110-year-old, 112-year-old uh, pipeline? You know, and if they would do that, they would, they would eliminate a lot of the, new, uh, a lot of the uh, problems. For instance, there are, you know, those, everything that you have, most of the problems that you have with that uh, polluting the air is is from leakage, and you're spending a lot of money. And I think I think if you could get the alumni to pitch in money to fix the uh, 
fix it instead of the taxpayers, I think we could solve a lot of problems. Thank you. Good. I'll, I'll start, I guess. I, I think what the question hits on is, is a really important dynamic. And first, I say the steam plant, which, as you point out, is mutually operated by CMU uh, and, and Pitt, and, and also UPMC has historically been involved and has gone through a series of conversions over the last, over the last decade or more, um, first converging, converting from you know, coal base to uh, natural gas. But I think the bigger highlight there is I, the opportunity which universities can be leaders in, in demonstrating for communities these major investments in clean energy technologies. And part of the, part of the mix of federal programs is this initiative DOE is launching called the Net Zero uh, campus initiative to really incentivize and support and fund uh, university-based projects that are also tied to the creation of new education programs so that the, the project is embedded in the effort to help develop a new generation of, of uh, future leaders who are, who are immersed in those capabilities. So again, just expanding beyond that point, any, any comments, particularly Sam or others on you know, how universities can be leaders in, in kind of driving the decarbonization. I, I was chomping at the bit just a bit there. I didn't understand uh, that y'all were on a district heating system. Um, we're, we're currently involved in a pretty large DOE program um, to exploratory drill for geothermal uh, to heat the district heating system for WBU. Um, hope to actually put shovels in the ground in about a month. Uh, we're in the final stage of contract stuff right now. But, uh, you know, things like that, you know, just looking at that, it's the same kind of thing. It's a steam, you know, steam district heating system across our whole campus. And we understand the, the footprint impacts that that could have. Uh, we'd have to figure out where we could, you know, park a drilling rig. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if there are opportunities for that in this region, you know, we, we think there's a lot of promise. That's the pitch I made to the West Virginia legislature is there's a lot of promise in the region for this kind of work. And I think, again, just more broadly, and again, at, for, for us, we have to be maybe more uh, cost-conscious than some universities do, just where, a, you know, it's taxpayer land grant, this kind of thing. But we have a lot of interest in how do you electrify campus, how do you drive energy, energy efficiency. We're having a lot of discussions about, like, what does EV charging infrastructure look like for a campus? Um, so just, I, I do think universities can be leaders in demonstrating that, and in also in trying to to find community partners to do sort of smaller scale. One of the things we're, we're trying to figure out is like the WVU hospital system um, and use the hospitals as an anchor for say like EV charging or something like that. That gets us across, you know, 20 some communities across the state just as a, gets us to put our flag on it, do a little technical development and, and then it's out in front of lots of people quickly. So I do think there's a great opportunity for universities to lead in that. That's great. And, and then another asset we have in this region to kind of build on this opportunity to highlight in the question, of course, is NETL, uh, which has both technical resources and, and is building capability in some of the core technology areas like direct air capture and so forth that might lend themselves. So, so we, have, we have both in our individual campuses as a collection of universities and working with NETL uh, an opportunity. And, and in some cases, there are some efforts you know, such as in, in the Hill District with the, uh, an idea to really kind of make these local demonstration efforts very community-based as well to get at some of the points that, that you've raised, Destiny, about in, inclusive participation. Yeah, and as, you know, private industry, we see so much benefit and, 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 and even just joy from collaborating with universities, you know, community-based organizations, because everybody brings different perspectives. I don't have all of the answers. I want to bring more voices in. Um, and so I think that that's, it's just, we, we kind of take an approach of lift all boats, right? The more people we can, we can lift up with our projects, the better. Daniel. Hi, my name is Jillian Miles. I am a PhD student here at Carnegie Mellon studying engineering and public policy. I was curious, given uh, the pretty incredible and inspirational strides we have made in the federal government um, in terms of policy that has been passed enabling decarbonization, what do we have to do at a state and local level to continue that momentum with, given the emphasis on local communities here? I think any best practices or examples of how we've overcome similar uh, quite uh, divided legislatures to get 
um, policy to enable these decisions to come to fruition um, would be great to hear about and to build upon. Question: Who, who wants to who wants to start digging into that? This is did, real, it's the last mile challenge of policy, and but it, did, it, you've hit on the big issue. Did I mention terrified? Um, that this is the question of the day. To be honest, um, I think I think everybody here is is in deep contact with that problem, right? That it's not as easy as just it seems like, you know, to, in terms of getting substantive engagement. I think where, uh, at least where I am in the process, is we figured out the stuff that doesn't work very well, um, the stuff that can get you, you know, just <laughs> killed at the line. You know, there was, there was a joke the other day, a phrase I'd never heard of before about, you know, we can't do these projects using the, the DAD model, the, the decide, announce, and defend model for project development. And it's like, okay, that, that tracks, I can buy that. Um, but, but for how you get out to, and, and it's been talked about here, you know, it's f folks that aren't going to be engaged in the process until it's, you know, code red for them. It's something that's a really big deal. How do you get their engagement in a, in a fair way? That's something we've been talking about with the project developers in a lot of cases, the folks that are at these meetings, they're being paid to be there. They're being paid pretty well, probably, to attend every meeting that ever happens on this project forever, whatever it is. The community's not in that boat. You know, how, how do we ensure that there's at least, you know, feed, feed the kids dinner money in, in coming to attend these, these events, this kind of stuff? It, it, it's basic, but that's the level we're starting to like piece together. Like what is the key barrier to getting this engagement? And some of it's not as obvious as it feels like. One of the other things is that building trust in a community takes a really long time to build, but it, you can, it can be destroyed in an instant, right? And I think that that is one thing that often gets lost in the conversation of how do we move this transition faster, right? It's all about speed, but I actually think that really the fastest we can move is at the speed of trust, right? So if we're going to do things that add trust, then we can keep pushing forward. But if trust needs to be built, then a lot of money is gonna to need to be put behind that and a lot of time is gonna to need to be put behind that. Um, one of the things that I firmly believe is that we have a lot of technologies at our disposal to make this transition happen. But where we hit a lot of roadblocks is in that social side, right? Because communities maybe don't trust it coming in, right? We had some issues even in the wind industry where farmers felt like they were being taken advantage of and now there's huge pushback for solar and wind coming onto agricultural land, right? And so that's why it's so important that we don't just look at these communities as checking a box, like, yes, I talked to them, okay, they were at the table, okay, now I'll, like talk to them at the end, but like really integrate them into our process, um, which, you know, you're an engineering public policy student, so if anybody's gonna work at the intersection, I'm sure it will be you, uh, so that will be great. But I do, I will just reiterate, I think that the fastest speed that we can move at is the speed of trust. And, and just to put a fine point on that, at least in some of the neighborhoods I'm in, trust is low. Um, you know, there, there's been decades and decades of, this is great for you, just wait. And, and maybe it hasn't been. So that, that is some of the uphill we're climbing of, show me my benefit today, <laughs> you know, in the short term. Or, or I'm not interested. You know, a lot of the, the communities I'm coming into start out with a position of, please just leave me alone. <laughs> and, and that's to, to get these kinds of projects done, you've, again, Tom, lots of Tom and lots of engagement. Yeah, and then just to put a positive spin on it, I think that once people see the benefit for themselves, right, it will be very easy to switch over. Uh, one of the things that somebody once told me was nobody stopped using typewriters because paper got really expensive. Right? It's because people showed them how the laptops and personal computers were so much more better for their lives than typewriters. And so that's one of the challenges that I see with trying to incentivize people to shift to decarbonization policies by making other things more expensive, right? Like making your natural gas supply more expensive. I always tell people, I'll be happy to switch my natural gas stove if you're going to rewire my house and make it the same cost as just buying another natural gas stove when mine breaks, right? And a lot of communities feel that way. Um, and it's just because the uphill cost is so expensive, making it even more expensive doesn't incentivize anybody to switch because then they have less savings. 
Um, and I think that, you know, that point about making sure that we are communicating to people how it benefits your life right now is going to be so important. Yeah, and I think that that's why, that's why we need to be thinking boldly about policy right now, right? Because it's, we can only move at the speed of trust. You have to trust that that developer is going to share what they promise they are going to share with you, right? And so if, that's why I, w I want us to think about policies that could maybe, sh I don't know, short circuit that a little bit or not. No, that's not the right way to put it. But, but you know, you said that you have, they have to see the benefit. Well, let's just give them a benefit. <laughs> <laughs> right? Instead of, instead of trying to extract it from the value of these tax credits, like, let's just, let's just think about what it takes. What is, how do we get communities on board, right? And that's probably not giving developers more money to go do it. It's, it's, it's giving the, the benefits directly to the communities. And I think that that's something that we can think, be thinking about at a federal, state, and local level. Great. Daniel, other questions? Thanks for a nice discussion. Um, uh, my name is Ed Rubin. I'm here at Carnegie Mellon. Um, a simple, dumb question. When I think about policies uh, in this domain, uh, I think about carrots and sticks. And um, one of the things that I think makes decarbonization unique compared to other environmental problems we've dealt with is so far, uh, we're only talking about carrots. Uh, right now, we have very large basket of carrots out there. Um, when I look at other uh, environmental problems, desulfurization, clean water, uh, other areas, uh, none of those problems have been solved in the time frames without some accompanying sticks, call them regulations, uh, other things that are requirements, not, not voluntary. Do any of you think that one of the barriers to decarbonizing the industrial sector is that still at the national level today, we have no mandates, no requirements that says you shall do something in a certain time frame in order to operate, uh, requirements that often establish markets for technologies like CCS without which, why would anybody spend money if there's no requirement to do it? Do any of you think there's a serious barrier that we don't have regulations, or do you think we can all do it, do it all with, with carrots? Great question. Yeah. I, can, I can quickly start. Um, so, so one of our portfolio companies makes uh, fully electric industrial yard trucks. It's a company called Orange EV. Um, and um, the state of California has now put out a legislation that basically if you if you're operating some form of, of a logistics operation um, and you don't adhere to certain environmental standards, that you need to pay a penalty. Um, and so that's a, that's a pretty big stick that all of a sudden is bringing lots of people through the front door of our portfolio company, which is... Which is the state of California is the only part of the U.S. that has, in fact, uh, a serious mix of sticks as well as we don't have that at the national level. So the question again, outside of California, is the absence of those kinds of uh, requirements a barrier to decarbonization? Yeah, and I think that you know where where I think where I was going with this is that you know you 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 need to have some some states very often that you know that are that are making the first steps in that. And if you look at some of the national policies, you know, they may have started in some states somewhere. So I think it's, you know, from, from our perspective, you know, um, maybe California, it may actually be, you know, if you look at like some of the, some of the solar legislation, um, you know, states like Massachusetts, we're sort of, you know, really thinking on, on, on the front line where uh, we have another portfolio company looking at community solar. There's, you know, folks in states like Illinois, states of New York. So it's, it's really, you know, my, my experience has been it's been very hard, you know, to do top-down things in, in this country. Um, you know, as you can probably tell from my name and accent, you know, I'm from the other side of the pond and, you know, feed-in tariffs, you know, were, were a thing in Europe. Um, and so there's different cultural aspects for, for why, you know, that happens. And so I think, you know, we're, we're always looking for, you know, who are, who are the early movers, who are the states? And I think that's, that's why, um, you know, it behooves states, you know, like, you know, Pennsylvania, like, you know, West Virginia, like lots of, lots of other places in, you know, in this region here to really think creatively, you know, what can you do on the state and local level that doesn't require, 
uh, you know, very complex um, mandates and, and models at the federal level and really be a trailblazer at the, at the local level. Yeah, and I'll just say that I think that the carrot stick framework is really challenging uh, when you're not just, when you're talking about real competition, there is kind of a bit of a race around things, knowing that this is, you have to kind of figure out where this is going to go, and there's other countries who are providing various incentives here, and that kind of thing. So the environment is one where um, it's, there, <laughs> there's just something global to this problem. There's just something global about it. And so I think carrots and sticks works better when you can put a box around where some of this exists. Um, this is one where, you know, a state or a government or an entity has to kind of shoot itself in the foot if they're going to do something that could potentially dampen uh, economic growth. So how do you achieve those decarbonization goals and still achieve economic growth? It kind of, it lends itself a little bit in the, you know, in the carrot department. Um, but the other thing is that, quite frankly, I think that everybody has found that, uh, you know, companies do a good job sometimes avoiding getting hit by a stick. And so, uh, so the sticks don't always uh, work as simply as maybe they, they sound like they should or they could. It would uh, create, we already have a lot of regulation and a lot of policy and things like that. I think we would end up kind of really creating even a more challenging environment for work to happen. And we really need to figure out how to facilitate work happening, partnerships happening, um, and, and this requires, you know, people working together and that kind of thing. So I think it's turned into a conversation much more about how do we create the conditions for, and that's how we landed in a, a bit more of a, of a carrot land, <laughs> um, because that, that it, we're, I think, naturally, you know, and from a cultural standpoint, um, conditioned a little bit better when it comes to, uh, you know, what's going to help make us competitive. It doesn't mean that those aren't, um, uh, you know, those shouldn't be kind of part of larger policy conversations. But I think there, we always have to then weigh the implications of what that looks like um, and the unintended consequences that we can think of in lots of different fields of what happened when we try to go with a stick mode for things, uh, which I won't get into, but I can think of it in everything from kind of education all the way, you know, there's, there's a lot of different um, uh, places when we, we try something that we think is going to incent behavior via a stick. And I don't think it's necessarily as simple as that. Not to say that the carrot approach is particularly simple either. You know, we're, we're again putting the big HVAC system into the tiny ductwork. So it's not, you know, that's not perfect either. Um, but I think that, you know, the, uh, the idea around the conditions for how do we create the fertile ground for um, is much more uh, of a gray area um, than, uh, than and, and how this legislation has, has come to bear. It's, it's much more in the create the fertile ground for mindset. So well, I'm going to respectfully disagree. Um, I think that we do need a national policy regulation to do this. I think that we've, we spent a lot of time trying to incentivize people to go greener for the benefit of many people, but like historically we got here because they have made a lot of profit by harming a lot of people, right? And when it comes to trying to get people to switch, appealing to somebody's humanity rarely works if they have a really, if they feel like they have a strong incentive not to do that, right? And so I think like, you know, if, if we're thinking of um, indentured servitude, for example, right? Like large national policy, there are people that try to skate by it, but actually having like a national stance that says we're not gonna do this anymore is gonna be so important to getting all the people who have historically been trying to push us away from decarbonization because it's too expensive, right? I don't know how my industry would survive that. They don't, if they don't want to do it, they're gonna try to skate by it. And I think that we do need to actually have a national policy that unifies and says, everybody in the United States is going to do this thing. I'd, I'd like to make two comments. One is that, is that, Ed, that we are actually starting to see the carrots materialize. Um, and sometimes they are combination carrots and sticks, but um, a couple examples, Washington State has a, a cap and invest program. Um, uh, Colorado has um, 
has implemented emissions limits on certain certain manufacturing facilities and has just expanded that the the scope of that program. And they're actually now working on a, a package of incentives to to kind of address the competitive elements of things. Um, so I think we're starting to see some of those happen, and that's why the voluntary credit space is also interesting to think about because compliance and voluntary doesn't always doesn't always go doesn't always match together. And I forgot my second point. That, that is a great discussion, and I, I do want to just underscore doc, one point Dr. Rubin made, and we have kind of lost a little bit of our policy muscle memory of the, the ability in the past to, to balance sticks with the technological cycle in particular areas, be it decarbonization or desulfurization, uh, addressing the ozone gap, um, dealing with the impact of phosphates on the death of the Great Lakes in, in the 50s and 60s, all were cases where there was an alignment between the stick and the technological path uh, to the solution. And that ended up, in effect, creating a carrot dynamic, uh, and, and we've lost a little of that. Now, decarbonization brings in different dimensions of complexity, but I think this is a, this is a rich vein. As we, as we think about beyond the life cycle of some of these programs, this question and the various points you've raised, I think, could become central to the, the next dimensions of, of the discussion. A, a good example of that is the fact that the 45Q tax credit lasts for 12 years. Nobody wants to shut these systems off after 12 years, so we're just kind of hoping and counting that there's going to be something on the back end to keep these projects going. And I think that's probably a pretty safe assumption, but it's still a concern, uh, especially amongst counterparties. You have to think about this in the context of where you want to end up. At the, there's no doubt that carrots can do lots of wonderful things and will. But we saw in, um, in Brian's talk some very aggressive goals that he attributed to the president. We don't have those goals enshrined uh, at a national level yet. So the question at the end of the day uh, is, will carrots get you to those goals? Will carrots get you 50% reductions by 2030? Will they get you net zero by 2050? That's the question you have to ask, not whether carrots will get you some reduction, whether it will get you deep reduction. And if the answer to that is no or not likely, then you have to have a serious conversation about sticks, which we have avoided for the last 20 years in, in, the, in the realm of decarbonization. We almost had it, uh, as, as Ashley pointed out. Uh, my sense is the demise of CCS is because there's no reason in the world to do it unless you're required to do it, unless everybody's required to do it. So there's no market for the technology, uh, just as there would be no market for a desulfurization or a wastewater treatment system without requirements. So uh, we've been evading that discussion, I suspect, for a long time. I was curious about your take on, on that. Thanks very much for your input. Yeah, Dr. Rubin, that, this is a great discussion. I have to be the uh, kind of referee here and say we, we're sort of running out of time. Maybe we can give like a 10-second quick summary and then we got to cut to a break just so people feel refreshed for our last panel. Uh, if anybody wants to respond very quickly to that, please do. Uh, I'll bring up a comment. I, I went to a dinner in Sierra Week um, and, and they made the point that, and it was a small group, it was a small group dinner, but they made the point that all of the solutions are in this room, right? If we all put all of our collective brain power together, we could solve so many of these problems, and that's what the value of, of these kinds of sessions. Um, so thanks to, and, and this has been a fantastic panel. I really think this won't be the end of us. <laughs> yeah, we will, we'll get the band back together again sometime. But please, please join me in thanking this panel for their incredible thought leadership. <laughs> Especially the, the pat you can see the passion that each of them brings to their various roles. And thank you all for the chance to moderate this great discussion. Yeah, thank you for moderating, Tim, and thank you to all the panelists. This is obvious. I had to cut you off. That's how good this con this conversation's been. So thank you for every, uh, for all of this and.